the demonstration. So we will just continue the lecture. concentration substitute it into the equation okay please take note that for this you are calculating for OH minus because it's a base so it's POH then you get it. 
five point two four. Okay, then next step is since they always ask for EH, you should do this conversion. This is probably one of the more common mistakes that students will make. The one is that the formula they think that it's they are directly calculating EH, they, for, they forget that for a base the result is actually for POH. Okay? So if you want to calculate for B H, you need to do 14 minus the BH. Okay? Alright? Okay. Now, hey, let me address something that Mr. Tan uh, mentioned to me. He said that some of the stu students asked him about the equilibrium. Now, I will use this as an example because all the values I need are here. Okay? I, when we give you these values, let's say, uh, let's say the, in this case is the KB, which is 1.74 times 10 to the minus 5. At the back of the home, you need to understand what physical meaning this number has. Okay? And you need to, every time you do calculation, it needs to be at the back of your mind. This is the number that we are talking about. This number for ionic equilibrium, most, the, most of the numbers, I think almost all are, are smaller than one. So the interpretation is this, uh, if I give you the equilibrium and I give you this, let's say, just ammonia and water. No, it's not a buffer situation, just ammonia and water, there's no salt involved, okay? What it would mean is that the position of the equilibrium lies very much towards the left, if the number is smaller than one, because you get the KB value by taking the NH4 plus times the concentration of OH minus, right? Over the concentration of ammonia. So if the net value is smaller than 1, that means the denominator is larger. That mean, and that in turn means that most of the ammonia is not ionized. Okay, it all exists in NH3. Four, not as NH4 plus 4. If it existed as NH4 plus 4, then you would have a KB value larger than 1. Okay, so that's what you need to bear in mind. And because that number is, the dissociation is so small, therefore we can make assumptions where, where to disregard it. Okay? Because if you see, I think the examples that you have seen, the less than 1% is dissociated. You see the concentration is 100 times or lower, often maybe even up to 10,000, up to 100,000 times lower, which in the power is 10 to power 3, 10 to power 4, 10 to power 5. Okay? Okay, let's look at example 3.3. 3. 
Okay, so here you have a situation where you need to understand what's happening here. You have potassium hydroxide, they um, add to ethanoic acid. So, to calculate the pH, is you need to consider three different situations. Okay? Now, potassium hydroxide and ethanoic acid definitely going to react. That reaction is not an equilibrium. That reaction is irreversible. Okay? So that's the equation. Now, the question that you always need to ask yourself, let's say if you have poured everything to a conical flask, what's inside that conical flask? Okay? That is sometimes not an easy question to answer because you need to, may need to do calculations. Okay, so what's left? You need to calculate to find out. And the three situations are these. Either the weak acid is in excess and therefore you have the weak acid plus the salt as first situation, or they can completely react with each other. So all you have is the salt, or you can have the strong base. Okay, the KOH. So these are the three possibilities. Okay, so from here, you can see the limiting reagent is actually potassium hydroxide. The sodium, uh, sorry, the ethanoic acid is in excess. Okay, so you must, what will be present in the container is you have ethanoic acid, you have the salt, sodium ethanoid, and you have water. Okay. So, use the equation to find the pH. Okay, so, take note now. You, what you have done is found the amount. The equation requires the concentration. Okay? So, you need to calculate the new concentration out. 
All right? So for the ethanoic acid, you already had some present, and then there was the amount that we acted with the KOH. So you need to do a subtraction to find out what is left, and then you need to, again you need to find the concentration. So these two values. This question is on page 20 of the notes. What is the effect of dilution on pH of a buffer solution? Okay, so look at the equation. You have pH, which is what you want to find out, and you have pKa. Think to yourself, what does is affected? Okay, what does what affects Ka? What the, what affects Ka? What kind of change can affect Ka? Temperature. Okay, you're not changing the temperature here. Yeah, dil is dilution. Okay, now. If you add water to the system, okay, A minus gets diluted. However, HA is within the same container, it will also get diluted. What you're looking for is a N is a ratio of A minus is to HA. So since both get diluted, if you work it out, you will find that the volume cancels off. So it doesn't make a difference to that ratio. Okay? So the ratio is still the same. Okay, so no effect of pH. However, as you have seen, uh, Your, if you use a dilute solution, okay, it will be 
easy for the A minus and the HA is used up if you add a substantial amount of acid or base. Okay, it is very dilute solution. Okay, so a dilute solution, okay, the buffer may not be so effective in controlling the pH. Because if you add, a, let's say, if it's very dilute and there's only a small volume, you don't use a large enough volume, you add a little bit, or let's say H plus, uh, HCl, for example, it can be over, all of the A minus can be added. Okay, and once that happens, then the pH, uh, the buffer can no longer function. Yes. Okay? Do you, do you all understand uh, that putting up your hand to tell me to slow down uh, is not a capital offence? Do you understand that concept? Uh? I won't actually kill you if you tell me to go, go slower. I may look like I want to kill you, but I won't. So are we done? Just put up your hand and tell me that you're done. Okay. Now. In university, uh, of all the big science work that is done, I think the biologists are the ones that make the most use of buffers because you will need to control the pH definitely. Okay? So it will be things like buffering capacity or you know, that will matter to you. Right? You need to understand how it works. Okay, so the buffering capacity refers to the amount of acid or base that can be added before the pH changes significantly. Okay? So a buffer is most effective when the amount of the weak acid or the weak base and the salt is much greater than the amount of H plus or OH minus that is added. Okay, one way of doing this is to make the buffer of higher concentration. The other way is simply to use a larger volume. Because here we are talking about amount. Okay? Now, when we talk about an effective buffer, we would want to buffer both acid and base. Okay? So, that situation usually occurs when it will be effective when the HA is equal to the A minus or the base is equal to the pH plus the salt. Okay? Therefore, it's equal amounts. In natural systems, like for example, blood, Okay, that may not be true. Blood is good at buffering. Later on, we'll discuss about blood is good at buffering acids, but not uh, so much at uh, buffering bases. Okay, because a lot of the waste is basically acidic. Okay, acidic buffer will have a maximum buffering capacity. Okay, this term you must know what it means. Maximum buffering capacity. Concentration of HA equals to A minus. So, when that happens, let's say you take log, you get log 1, which is equal to 0, and so the buffer will be at the maximum buffering capacity where the pH is equal to the pKa. Okay? Okay, similarly, alkali buffer, maximum buffering capacity is when the base is equal to its concentration is equal to the salt. 
BOH, so the ratio of B, the salt is to the base is 1, okay, not 1, 0, then BOH equals to BKB. Alright? So, the buffer for is most effective when the ratio is 0.1 between 0.1 and 10. So, in terms of log terms, it's basically pKa minus 1, pKa plus 1. So, the effective range is for the buffer is when the pH is basically plus or minus 1 of the pKa. That is the range that the buffer will work effectively. Right? Okay. Basically, uh, this this thing is this the buffers are, are not some magical substance that that Marvel comics or what they come with. Okay, it cannot buffer like from zero to so so one to fourteen. Okay, so there if you do an experiment, you need to need to work at pH five. You need to find a buffer where the maximum buffering capacity matches that the pH 5 for example there are probably thousands of different things that can work as a buffer and you will need to go and look at it ok, there are a lot of considerations bio students, you all understand this it would probably occur for you all when you get to use this when you go for your attachment and say an NTU or you do some molecular biology thing then it's fairly important you understand this okay so effective buffer range for an alkali buffer okay is again PKB plus or minus one now let's take a look for the bio students I'm not sure how detail you have studied this physics students this is not an enrichment section you need to understand ok it's in the syllabus ok do not worry, you don't need to draw the flying saucers and the rectangles and all that. You just need to know what it means. Okay? Can I have your attention and more importantly, can I have your silence? Mission. Don't get so excited. Okay? Now, basically, when you eat, okay, the body extracts energy by con doing a series of chemical reactions. The end product is usually carbon dioxide. Okay? So, the carbon dioxide will probably diffuse out of the cell. Now, the interesting thing about biological systems uh, is that they want things... It has worked out that these reactions take place very quickly. So, in the body, there are many, many en uh, enzymes which function as catalysts. Basically, enzy uh, enzymes are proteins that catalyze reactions. So, there's actually an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase that con um, functions, the function is it CO2 plus water, it makes it into carbonic acid. And it takes place if I'm not mistaken, like a million times faster than if you allow it to occur naturally. Okay, it's very much, it's much faster. It's around there, maybe, maybe 100,000. Okay? So, the CO2 can get attached to the hemoglobin, which is the stuff that makes your blood look red. Okay, it also carries oxygen. Or they can, once the carbonic anhydrase goes in, it can dissociate to give you hydrogen carbonate plus H plus. Okay? So, the cell respiration, like I said, produces CO2. Then, 
the dissolving of the CO2 in the water or, or the blood plasma okay, is aided by the enzymes. Now, once it forms a H2CO3, it will dissolve.